Linus Rush, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing well, thank you, Ryan. How are you? I'm better now than I'm seeing you, man. You're <laughs> one of my all-time favorite actors, man. I, I you know, a, a reoccurring theme on this podcast is the separation between good acting and great acting. And you're one of the greatest actors in the world. Watching you perform is it's always like a master class, you know. I probably discovered you and maybe what a lot of people did in, in Batman Begins, but you know, there's something I think so amazing about great actors like yourself where, you know, you can take a role where you, you have, you know, a substantial role, but a few scenes and you just made that, uh, you just brought Thomas Wayne. Is that the, his name? That's what I played. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you just brought him to life and they're so likable. And then Vikings, Homeland, Law and Order, everything else I've seen. You're, you're amazing, brother. Well, that's, that's incredibly sweet to hear. Um, uh, I must say in these times where, you know, work is very lean and there's not a lot of feedback, it's lovely to hear something yeah. like that. Oh, man, I'm rude for you every day, man. And... Um, yeah, but anyway, no, it's, it's very sweet of you to say that. I mean, I, I, one of the things I've been contemplating about my own career recently is that I kind of maybe made the rope that has slightly hung me because sometimes people don't realize that the guy from Law and Order can also do stuff like Vikings or yeah. crazy movies like Mandy. So I think sometimes people don't know what to do with me, uh, which is kind of fun, but also uh, has its own challenges because sometimes I think I've missed out on some stuff sometimes because people think, oh, no, he can't do it because he's just the law and order guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, get, getting trapped in the procedural world, I can imagine right. that stuff. But I'm right. going to write you your Oscar-winning film. But before we do that, let's, let's start at the beginning, man. You, you grew up in Manchester? Um, I was born up in the north of England, yeah. I was born into an acting family. Both my parents were actors. Two very different careers. My yeah. father is actually, um, he's 88 now, and he is in the Guinness Book of World Records. He is the longest surviving member of an original cast of a TV show. And he is still playing that character today. Wow. Uh, I grew up with that. And in, in that era when I was growing up, which was, you know, I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, uh, celebrity was kind of a fairly new thing. That kind yeah. of- what, this, Yeah. Yeah. We weren't working, it was only been like maybe 20 years that actors were working with money in studios, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And suddenly my dad, who was like the youngest member of the cast, he was the sort of ingenue lead, good looking guy yeah. uh, on the show. Suddenly he was this household name. He was in everybody's living rooms in the UK and he's kind of been there ever since. So he had an extraordinary career. And my mother conversely was more of an actor's actor like a uh, theater, you know, or, or yeah. character. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of theater and a lot of um, what you call progressive avant-garde work. Like she worked with early uh, guys like Ken Loach. Oh, and wow. He, you know, she took a lot of drama to its edge, literally sometimes. Well, there's one particular performance that I'm still stunned by. She left us in 2007. But oh, she was a hero I'm so sorry for your loss. That's a long time ago, but thank you. But she played, um, she did a, a TV a film with Ken Loach called Into Minds, and she played a young woman with schizophrenia. Yeah. And the way Ken Loach works is very authentic, as you know, but he had at the end of the movie, he had a real room of doctors and they had my mum come in and they didn't tell them that she was an actress. Wow. And they actually, the end of the movie is them diagnosing her and, and giving a prognosis. And it's chilling to watch. But that was the kind of actress she was, you know. Yeah. So I grew up in these two kind of different worlds of, of fame and popularity on one hand and the actor's actor on the other. And I felt like I was always kind of, I had a tug of war between the two. But anyway. Yeah. And so talk to me, you know, being a kid and having parents that are in the business, I feel like it always goes one or two ways. You, you reject the parents and you're embarrassed by them as we all are at times and you don't want to do acting or you love it and, and, and you want to pursue it yourself. What, talk to me about your journey. Did you know very early on that you, that was something you were interested in? Well, it's really interesting. It's a great question, actually. I, I actually remember the day when the penny dropped for me. And I think I was about eight years or nine years old and we were in 
a class, and I can't remember what kind of class it would have been, but the, the teacher actually had us do a little improvised scene. Yeah. For like, and, and basically I had, I had to play a kid who didn't want to go to school. So I remember doing this scene and just, I just went for it. I just, I didn't know what else to do. I just yeah. kind of stamping my foot. And suddenly I realized all the kids in the classroom were responding to it. And I had that aha moment. I thought, oh, I'm doing this. I believe in it and they're getting it and they're responding to it. And I had that moment where I thought, well, I like football. I'm, I'm okay at English, but this is something I could be good at. Yeah. And I love play acting and pretending to be God knows who, John Wayne or whoever, you know, just running like we all do. But then I, I realized quite early, yeah, I want to do this. And then interestingly enough, uh, the opportunity came up to play my dad's son. No way. That's so radical. Yeah. In, in his show. And I actually uh, came up with a little story and the story went really well. And then they said, do you want to join the show full time? And so it was this moment where we had a big discussion within the family, like, is this a really smart thing to do for a 10 yeah. year old kid? And we actually decided that I wouldn't do it. So I didn't do it. Wow. And I did a couple of little TV things. And then I remember my mom was really great because she was kind of like, look, if you're going to do this, this, don't waste your childhood doing it. Have yeah. your childhood, get it out of your system. And then, and then do it professionally later. So I was always knowing I was going to be a professional, yeah. but I reject at school a lot of the time I was rejecting it because they were always forcing me to do it because yeah. my parents were actors. So uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Gigantic yeah, elephone in the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So and I was constantly like going, to, I went to a lot of different schools. My parents divorced when I was 10. It was kind of one of those childhoods, you know, and I'd yeah. end up somewhere. And then they'd say, you've got to be in the school play. And I was like, no, get away from me. I don't want to be in it. And then eventually I went to a boarding school in, the, in Wales, which is sort of, you know, not part of England. It's a separate yeah. you know, part of the, the UK. And there I was in this remote place. And suddenly theater became something I thought, well, I could find a home here. And I started doing plays there. And then I went to the National Youth Theater and I always knew I wanted to go to drama school. So I was just so hungry to get to drama school. And you went to I one was, of the best in the world, Central School of Speech and Drama, right? I did. I actually got into RADA as well, but I went to Central because my mum went there. So I was going, I'm going to the school my mum went to. <laughs> was that a difficult decision for you to make? Because like those are, you know, that's Juilliard and Yale of the UK. Did you, True. did you have to ponder that for a while or? I, I did a little bit. I think it was just this sense of kind of um, slight loyalty to my mom. And I mean, Hugh Crockwell, who ran, ran Rada at the time, was very good and very sweet and very generous. But I just, I think it was, maybe I was a mommy's boy or something. But I No, actually, no, we all are. I, yeah. I wanted to go, I wanted, I, there was something about Central. Also, actually, I didn't do very well on my first round of the audition at Central. So there was a pride thing about going back and making good. Yeah. So I, I walked into the Rada, but I struggled to get into Central. So I kind of, I, maybe yeah. the theme for me, I'll often go with the thing where it's a bit- We got to earn it. Yeah. yeah. So talk yeah. to me about your experience there. You know, it was, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so jealous of you Brits because I say it on the time, uh, all the time on the show. You guys are so vastly superior to us. And part of that is, you, you know, you got Elizabethan roots and, and also you, you spend time doing Shakespeare, which is something American drama schools too often skip over. And there's no small choice in Shakespeare. So, you know, yeah. when you're, when you're playing that, you know, iambic and, and uh, it, it just makes you such a drastically better actor. Was that a, was that well, something, you know, it's very sweet of you to, to say that, but I'm actually of a different, slightly different camp. I've always kind okay. of, I don't, I don't say that British actors are better by, by any means. I mean, there may be because of just the inherent background in the theater and because of the Shakespearean, you know, the Jacobean text and all of that, there's a bit more maybe of a grounding in yeah. the classics, which I yearned for when I was training to be an actor, I wanted the classics. I was like, I want it, eventually I want to do film. Yeah. But I, I thought I can't just go straight to film. I'm going to have to go through this rigorous training in the classics. And so maybe there's some truth to what you're saying, but I've always had the ultimate respect for a lot of the, the actors I was looking up to with the James Dean, Montgomery, Cliffs, Marlon Brando. Yeah, those were, those the are my gods. The know? real actors. Yeah. 
Or, so that's or, what I, I was aiming there, but I also was going, well, I got to go. I want to get my muscles worked out. And I did, I did my, I call it my national service. You know, I got into the Royal Shakespeare Company. Amazing. I spent, I spent four years on and off there, pretty much like two full seasons. And I went, uh, I was in the national for a year and I was on the West End. So I really was doing that work yeah. and going, I'm a little scared of film. Yeah. To be honest, was there the a, other way? I'm, no. I don't, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Right. No, Wait, it, no. Was there a ripe British cinema scene yet there or was it? it well, yeah, there wasn't quite. I mean, there's always been the sort of, you know, the Ealing Comedies and the Pinewood Studios, and there's always been an yeah. industry. That, uh, one of the great things that was happening as I entered into um, becoming a professional actor was it, like on the BBC, they were doing this, these things called Screen One, Screen Two, which were basically movies that were funded and they would do a season of them like 10 or 12 like 12 yeah. independent each of them with new writers new talent and for example my big break was in a movie called priest which was actually a screen too it was a small low budget antonia bird jimmy mcgovern wrote it it was a tv movie and and it was under a million quid at the time but they had the money to do those so that was what sort of rose up, I think, that kind of talent came out of that. Yeah. And then you've got your uh, Channel 4, Screen 4, you know, the BBC films and all of these things came out of that. And once you got knighted as, so to speak, in your first film credit, were, were you like then tactically, I want to focus on this or were you still balancing it with theatre as well? To begin with, I was balancing it with theatre because um, I had that that idea that that's your true home. Yeah. So you always have to go back. Yeah. But then I took a different turn in my life, which is probably a, a topic for a whole other discussion about, you know, I really got into like, what's the meaning and purpose of all of this? And oh, I like Schopenhauer just, and yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I really, at one point, I threw the whole thing up in the air and I just quit. I just quit acting and I walked away and, uh, and I left it for a couple of years. And when I came back, I found that my life had changed so much that I was more interested in just doing film and having more space. Yeah. Because the theater, as you know, is just, I find it, you know, I went back um, and did a show in 2016 and it was, I hadn't been on stage for 10 years. It was like walking through fire. <laughs> what, what production did you do? It was actually an off-Broadway um, it was the first round of Junk uh, by Ayad Akhtar. Oh, yeah. San Diego. So I thought, well, this would be a good place for me to go and test my muscles out, you know? And yeah. I, oh, Ryan, my God, I was like, I had so much respect for, for the craft and what it takes. Because it might always, you could say, like riding a bicycle, it's always in you. But if you haven't lifted those weights in a while, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot. You know, I know. I was I was just going through it. I had no space in my head for anything else. It was the show, yeah. the show, the show. So I think I've chosen mostly to stick to film and TV, which I've grown to love now. And I've grown you're to love. One, you're one of camera. the best in the game, and I I mean that. And I'm I'm dying to see you in a play. So hopefully you're, that'll be in your future as well. But talk to me yeah. when you when you finally did come back and and you knew you wanted to do film and TV. Being mm. British, did you feel the you know, longing to come to America and, and work? Or were you well, happy? I, mm, I was kind of lucky in that, I mean, I had that moment, and this is partly why I walked away from it all, to be honest. I just, in all honesty, I just wasn't mature enough or able or able to embrace success. I just wasn't yeah. in me at that time. And so when Priest came out, Miramax picked it up. It went ballistic over here. I, I came over and it was sort of like, you know, come here, do this, you know, this taking meetings and so forth. It was wonderful. Yeah. And so yeah. in one, in one regard, it was wonderful. Yeah. But I felt so uncentered and so unable to cope with it. Yeah. That's partly why I quit. So then I think I just took some time to be able to get my own love of doing it because I love the craft. I had to I do the same thing. Acting. Yeah. You did? You did? Yeah. You did oh, I, I, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict, so I had to get sober, you know? Good for and, you, man. Yeah, Good yeah. And so, so I I did my whole NYU thing, and then I stepped away from it, and I didn't come back till I'm 26, no, 25. 
and I'm, right. I'm at 30 now, you know? So it's, I, I totally relate to that and I have well, nothing respect. but respect. Yeah. Yeah. Respect. So, t- so then when you did come back to it, what were your steps into, to going back in? Were you doing more of the BBC projects or? Um, well, I was lucky in that when I, when I, when I did walk away, I had a kind of like a movie in the bank, if you like. So I, I still oh, had. Oh, so one was I, coming out. Yeah, well, Priest had come out, and and so I was riding the wave of that for quite some time. And when I came back, I chose to do a film that, in a way, I was a little bit bullied into it, but I did it anyway. And I felt like I, I, it was the biggest lesson of my career yeah. because I came back going, okay, I'm going to do this movie, but I'm not going to get all caught up in the mechanism of all of this. I'm just going to do the movie and do the job. But I wasn't actually fully committed to the project. And I forever feel like that was the biggest lesson of my life is that whatever I do, whether it's a student film, whether it's a podcast, whether whatever yeah. one is doing, you kind of, it's your duty to turn up 100%. Yeah. So that became my motto from then on because I felt like I'd done that film from a distance and, and funnily enough, it kind of worked for the role in a weird <laughs> That way. sounds amazing. <laughs> so, but it didn't, it didn't work for me. So yeah. I then found that, okay, my job, my craft is that I love, I love the craft of acting. And I hadn't quite realized as well, going back to our earlier thing about my dad's career was very much about, you know, I suppose being recognized in a way is very, as a celebrity and yeah. well known for one thing. And, and my mom's career was all about this diversity. And I realized, well, I love the diversity and yeah. that's what I want. I yeah. want to keep turning the tables as much as I'm able to, as much as people will give me that opportunity that's what I'll be drawn to. That's so beautiful. And 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 were your parents supportive when you came back in? And oh yeah. Went, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Very much so. And I actually went back on the show and played my because it's a soap opera. You know, they can only do this in a soap opera. I came back as my dad's long lost other son. No so, way. <laughs> <laughs> so it all came full circle. It did. Yeah. And my my half brother, my dad's uh, kids by his second marriage, played my son. Oh my so, God! A family affair. <laughs> and it was it was so much it was so much fun to do, you know. So it was a it was a great thing to do, and and I got to work with my mom as well. Um, one of the first little breaks I got actually before Priest was doing one of these again these little movies that the BBC would do. I, I got to play Van Gogh. Uh, wow. Van Gogh at the age of 25, you know, which is an amazing thing to be able to yeah. give them to do and to play him from 19 to his death at 36. Yeah. Right, in this bizarro uh, movie with um, Jim Broadbent and these wonderful actors, and Jack Shepard, heroes of mine, you know. Yeah. In this so I, I got to, to do that. And she, my mum, bless her, she played my mum in that show. So. We got to actually work together before she died. Yeah. Oh, that makes me, that warms my heart up. That's so beautiful. So talk to me then, when, when did the America transition happen? What was the project in? Well, funnily enough, the, the reason I came to the States was for something else. And, and, uh, but at that time, I sort of discovered that I was working more away from home than I was working at home. So yeah. I remember one year I was back to back in Canada, just shooting in, Vancouver, then Toronto and Montreal. And, and uh, I sort of thought, well, I'm not bound to the UK. I've always loved America. I feel more at home here than I did in the UK. I felt there was wow. more opportunity. I also felt uh, in a way, those actors I mentioned earlier, you know, that yeah. my heroes came from here and I wanted to be part of that whole system. And I found also that in the UK, it's, a, it was a, it's probably not true now, but it was true when I was growing up there was a bit of a sort of a snobbery or you didn't talk about the craft of acting. It was like, if you're a professional actor. Wow. So interesting. I'm a professional actor. You don't talk about it. You just yeah. do it. You know, it's a bit like how we got through the war, I think, you know, but um, <laughs> when it comes to like over here, I just love the fact that people are still, ex- we're still exploring the craft and all these different methods and techniques and, and, and ways and people coming to set with a coach and yeah. all of this stuff. And I just kind of loved all of that. So I just wanted to sort of get involved in that as much as I could. And, and I think I've always loved America and Americana. And that's why I decided to sort of stay here. And I got, I got lucky, you know, I got a few good gigs and 
it's allowed me to stay. But you earned it. I mean, you, you're such a hardworking and dedicated actor. I'm curious, you know, because I guess, I, I tell me if I'm saying this wrong, but I don't think I am. Like, Batman Begins was like 2005, maybe? You know, like... Yeah, yeah. Talk to me yeah. about that project and how you got involved with that. Did you know Chris's work at that point? Not very well. I mean, I'd seen it, but I hadn't been aware just what a genius Chris Nolan was. Yeah. Uh, but I think the role came my way mostly because I'd played Robert Kennedy, I think. Which you got nominated for a Golden Globe for. We can't gloss over yeah. that. Um, and so I met Chris. I remember actually was in LA and then they did that thing where they sent a messenger to the hotel with a script and you had to read the script with your name encoded on it and then you had to deliver the script back. You know, wow. you had to keep it and then some Mission Impossible self-destruct. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was in London and I met Chris. I went to his office, I remember, and we talked about it. And then he asked me to do it. And I was like, it was at the time, I think a lot of people were actually turning that role down because it was spread over like four or five months. So it was a really tricky role to get an actor to do. Wow. And I was actually living in the US at the time. That was shooting in the UK. So I literally flew back about five to seven times to shoot the movie. And the funniest part about it was, <laughs> I, I'm remembering this now, I, I met Chris and then I went off to do a movie um, with Vin Diesel called The Chronicles of Yeah, Riddick. Chronicles of Riddick, classic. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it was partly my idea to sort of buzz shave my head and have it dyed platinum blonde, which I thought was pretty cool. Lo and behold, we shot this scene on, in Riddick. And then eventually when it came time to shoot Batman Begins, I, it was quite a few months later, I had to go back for a reshoot on Riddick. And that meant I had to recut my hair and do it. And so I turned up to play Thomas Wayne with like hardly any hair and a platinum blood. And, and Chris Nolan just took one look and he was like, oh. <laughs> Did you have to and wear they, a wig or? No, in fact, it was, I was in, they, part of the deal was that I would only do the reshoot if they would make me this really expensive wig. And, but no one was like not having a wig. So we just had to go off. And I don't know, probably nobody really noticed this, but if you look in the film, my hair is ridiculously short for Thomas Wayne, but they just dyed it really well and got that platinum blonde out. But I just always remember he was very calm. <laughs> But he was also deeply shocked yeah. at what had <laughs> just turned up for his Thomas Wayne. And would you say, you know, before, you know, you did Batman, you did Riddick, obviously, was that your first, like, major budget movie? You know what I mean? No, but no my first one was uh, a few years earlier, uh, probably in 2000, was um, uh, Heart's War with Colin oh, Farrell. Oh, yeah and Bruce Willis, and that was my first insight into a mega budget film and, you know, being with someone like Bruce on the set. Yeah. Colin, was, Colin was relatively new. I don't think Phone Booth had even come out when we were doing Hearts War. Wow. He, he, he'd done a movie called Tigerland, and that was kind of it. Yeah, my, my, my buddy Shea Wiggum was in that with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love him. I love, he's a great actor. That's yeah, great actor. yeah. But yeah, so that was my first insight into the crazy world of big budget films, but I think Rod Riddick was its own kind of yeah. race. Like, it was like playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, was it, it was, was it fun? You know, like the sets being like that and, and a world yeah. of kind of sci-fi-ish, like is it, was yeah. it tough to bring truth to that? Because... Um, <laughs> that's a great question. That's a really great question because yeah. it, was, it was actually tough because I do remember it, it probably was one of those movies, and I, I wonder if they really have the luxury of making these kind of films anymore, where you've got $120 million on the line, and they're still saying, well, man, what does it mean if you go to the Underverse? I mean, can you go there in a spaceship? I'm like, like doing that on set and wow. not filming for a whole morning, like literally sitting around going, like there's one scene in that movie, we did not start rolling till after lunch. The crew wow. were just, eating sandwiches, waiting around. And that's a scene we went back and reshot six months later. It's kind of like a luxury, yeah. if you like, of like, like, well, what, they were still making 
up a lot of the story of the movie as we were doing it yeah. um that's more the kind of thing you imagine in low budget <laughs> yeah <laughs> not when there's so much at stake and i remember we'd go to work on a monday and you'd be working your regular sort of 12 hours and you'd go over by a bit by the end of the week we were going in uh, like at the end of the day and shooting all night because wow. the hours had slipped so it was kind of like an out of control Thing. trial by fire yeah it was yeah. just like or, and, and it seemed to be that when there was a problem they'd throw more money at it and so it was one of those so it was quite a, a, an extraordinary yeah i don't think i don't think life. that that world of filmmaking and nonsensical spending exists anymore you know i don't think it does there's too many people standing around going hey this is just a waste of time come on yeah. we need to get our shit together and yeah totally have, have a good story that but as it turns out riddick seems to have touched a lot of people's crazy hearts and yeah people and it's people it's done me some good as well. I, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie Mandy, but I ended up in Mandy. I love Mandy. Of, yeah. I, that was because of Riddick. So you no never way. know what, what role is going to give you the, the next one sometimes. Would, would you say then that Batman Begins or Riddick was the thing that really opened you up into American audiences and started to become known here? Um, well, I know. I think initially what opened me up was actually Priest and then wings of a dove and and then i suppose really i suppose mainstream over here probably was not till law and order oh wow yeah. well yeah. a couple more questions on on batman begins is you know yeah. you talked about how you know in in britain it was pretentious to talk about acting and process but what you did with thomas wayne it's like what i think is a testament to your amazing capabilities brother is that like I just wanted more of him. You know what I mean? Like I wanted, I almost wanted a Thomas Wayne movie. You were just so, you were so, such a loving father. And it was just, you know, even though any comic book fan in the world knows that he doesn't live, it was just mm. like, you, you just touched, it just warmed your heart, you know, that kind of love. And did you work mm. really hard with a coach on that? Or was that just your instincts? Well, you know, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I, I don't know how else to be but candid. I, I honestly, to be totally fair, I, yeah. I think there are some sometimes when uh, a role is just well structured, crafted into a piece. Yeah, I think I think I'm not saying anybody could have done it, but it's it's not it's almost actor proof. You, you just had to deliver it because T it's testament so to great writing. Exactly. And yeah. great structural thinking because the role, the way Nolan places it inside of the film, it is so systemic and endemic to Bruce Wayne's, you know, flowering and where he gets that confidence and that advice, you know, whenever yeah. we fall, why do we fall down, Bruce? And that's my we, favorite line. <laughs> so we can, yeah. So really, if you think about it, it's a very small role, but it's placed so beautifully and perfectly yeah that people have this amazing response to it. To be honest, I didn't do much more than show up and just try and be there in the moment, connect with the kid, carry the kid up the stairs, which was actually really hard work. Um, <laughs> because one time the, the kid had to go home and I actually did the death scene to Chris Nolan. I, the, the kid had done his hours, so he left. He had gone home. So I was, I died and said, we're not alone, Bruce, to, to Chris. <laughs> oh my um, God, that's so cool. <laughs> but that's what I, just one thing, because you seem, you know, particularly interested in that movie. One thing I, I mean, I love Chris Nolan's work. I'm, I'm a real- I'm just fascinated by that pivot from Memento to do a big studio film and then make it one of the greatest of all time and then go back to what he loved doing. I mean, it's brilliant, you know what I mean? But that's what he's done with like, inception you know yeah. he, took, he took like uh, you know this very layered complex world world of consciousness and dreams but turned it into a mainstream thriller i mean it's so dynamic i haven't seen tenet yet i can't yeah me it. either I, but i love him and jonathan nolan you know they were yeah. they're so brilliant yeah. so then what i loved about his the way he worked uh, and this is i just wish this could happen every time you walk on a movie set because Chris isn't necessarily the kind of guy that I look at and feel like, hey, I'd love to hang out and have a beer with you. Yeah. But when you're on a movie set, it, it, it doesn't matter that there's a hundred million dollars or whatever's going on, or there's all of this pressure and all that. He's just there for you for that moment. Wow. So 
in a way you're allowed to relax. Yeah, he's an actor's director. He is in in the sense that he gives you the space. Yeah. So a lot of directors won't give you the space. Yeah. Or the the machinery is so intense that you have to spend most of your time trying to create the space where you can just be. And then a lot you're fighting the system. But Chris is about nothing else matters. We're all here for this. Right now, it's just you and me right now. That's it. And so in a way, you go, okay, I can relax now. I can just play the scene or play the moment. Yeah. And that's a great talent of his. And obviously why his films have this kind of um, beautiful precision to them. There's a, yeah. It's like a Swiss watch to me, watching his films. It's, it's, it's art and it's craft beautifully yeah. meshed together. Yeah, it absolutely is. Well, then let's talk about Law and Order because you did 63 episodes of that, you know? Did, yeah. did, did, did those kind of procedurals, I mean, I know I've seen Luther, but did they exist in the UK? Um, yeah, we had them. We had plenty of them, but they were often, you know, very short runs. You know, yeah. a, a, a season of six episodes would be a big deal of something. You know, wow. like the, orig- the original House of Cards was just six episodes. Oh, <laughs> really? So, yeah. I still have yet to see the original. I, I really have to watch it. Yeah. But yeah, we had, we had all those shows growing up, you know, detective shows, and there'd be seasons of them and stuff like that. But yeah. they were never quite as uh, prolific. And I mean, Law and Order was an interesting timing thing for me in my personal life in that I wasn't looking. I, I often walked away from things that were going to take me away around the other part of the world for like five years or something. I, I and did wasn't... you know that it was going to be that long or at least that your contract said, well, hey, I'd walk. Yeah, I'd walked away from a lot of those opportunities early on because I didn't. It scared me to get. Yeah tied into something for a long period of time. Yeah. But by this time in my career, I was like, wow, I could live in New York City and go to work every day, uh, you know, in a city that I love and, and go to work and be in this thing, I'll, I'll do it. I thought, you know, maybe four, five, maybe five years I could handle. Yeah. And we didn't know when I signed how long it would go for. And then we did three and it was the last three. Um, but I, I loved it. And I think what I loved about it was it, it actually allowed me to bring back my love of theater because yeah. every Friday I was in the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and so I'm, true. I never thought about it like that. Yeah, it really was. It really was. You know, and I get these summations to do. And, and I was very lucky in, in that job in that I think it would have been too much to ask of anybody to have Sam Waterston leave the role and leave the show yeah. and try and take over. But because Sam and Jack McCoy got to stay and become my boss, it, yeah. it sort of allowed me to be the new guy, yeah. the upstart, and be mentored by him, which I literally was as well. You know, Sam oh. kind of mentored me a bit. In that I role. love Sam. He's a great actor, man. Uh, what You know, on those shows, the, because they can be so procedural in the dialogue and it's like you you got all this vernacular how do you bring truth to that because you were so amazing you know and it's tough because you know sometimes Mm. you have to say these things that Mm. we we as humans don't always talk that way but it looks good in those shows and in that Mm. style was that was that something you're right right. it's really challenging because you know as you know in law and order that that a lot of it you have to bring all the context of, of a case into a scene you've actually got a lot of exposition you've got a lot of stuff that you just got to get out and it's got to be clear and then you've got all the legalese and all of that stuff so i uh, i enjoyed the challenge of that but i think my intuition is always to work with an emotional intelligence so i can't just learn it as a sort of a a fact as a rote fact or something i had to find an emotional reason yeah. for why this particular piece of legalese mattered, you know? So I was always looking for that emotional connection and that's what made the character or the way I played that role sometimes kind of a little bit pushy, edgy, yeah. sometimes not even that likable, you know? He was juggling chainsaws a lot and just messing things up. And so I sort of embraced that from the beginning and I I'd, I'd only remember a couple of times kind of just being a bit tired yeah. and like falling over myself a bit. So you have to know your shit. You have to really know your shit because it's fast. You know, yeah. There's no time. But and, I like that too, you know. And was that project what finally made you live here? No, was that? The I was. One? Al- I was already. I moved over in two thousand and two, and Law and Order came my way in two thousand. I got it in two thousand six. 
Wow. So, and I'd done like a Sydney Lumet film here. I'd done another movie. I'd done a TV show that didn't kind of get picked up called Kidnapped with Jeremy Sisto, actually. No, um, I love Jeremy Sisto. Yeah. 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 He, he, yeah. It, it's so fascinating seeing his Titanic screen test, you know, just knowing. Oh, yeah. It, it could have, you know, uh, uh, six feet under, a couple of people yeah. from the show are about to do yeah. the podcast. But talk, oh, right. to, talk to me then, you know, Law and Order's here and then Vikings is here. What was it like to go from that world to that world? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th that was a interesting. I can't remember what happened straight after Law and Order because we all thought that was going to go at least one more year. And I think there was some sort of big fight between Dick Wolf and the head of NBC. And Ooh. suddenly it just, you know, we were, I got a phone call saying, empty out your dressing room. It was the middle of the, um, the hiatus. And oh. like the show was off the air. I was like, okay, we'll move on. I can't remember what I did next, but. It wasn't too long after, you're right, that uh, I was actually in that little um, dead zone where you're just looking for work and you don't know where the next thing's coming from and yeah. you can't even get arrested. And I'd gone to LA and I was going, I was being penciled for this and nearly getting this. And it was like, what the hell's going on? And then I went to the UK to see my dad in Manchester, an old buddy of mine was shooting in Ireland and we arranged to meet up. I went over to Ireland. We got incredibly drunk uh, oh. in, in Connemara. And he, st and he talked to me about this show called Vikings saying, you know, I'd love to get on the show called Vikings. It's really, really cool show. And I literally flew back to Manchester the, the next morning, hung over. I got two phone calls out of nowhere, no connection saying, you got an offer on Vikings and you got another job in Belfast. And I hadn't worked for like six months. I was like, this business is crazy. I don't know yeah. where it came from. So I had a chat with Michael Hurst, uh, who wrote and created Vikings. Didn't really know where the role was going when yeah. we started it. But me and him had that wonderful kind of thing that occasionally happens between actors and showrunners and writers where you just kind of meet and, yeah. and, you, and you start co-creating a bit. So he actually allowed me to input into the story. And Travis Fimmel, who plays Ragnar, who I just spoke to the other day, He's one of the, I tell you, that guy's one of the smartest actors I've ever worked with. Wow. You know? So yeah, it was, looking back on that, was that a great time in your life, filming oh, that? Wonderful. I mean, wonderful. just the, the historical and the, you know, verisimilitude to those worlds. It must have been just, you know, just as an actor to show up on set like that, you know, so much of your work is done for you by, by the yeah. amazing scenic designers and, and costumers and, that's true. I mean, they built a very real world. So you and was that filming in Ireland? Yeah, and that was the other thing I was going to say. I mean, Ireland's like my second home now. I love that place so much. I love the people. I love the crew. It was just unbelievable crew to work with. There was this sense of all being uh, a big, literally a big family. They use that word a lot, but like it was a big family doing this show. And there was no big studio execs standing over anybody. Breathing down what your what neck. Do. We had freedom, man. It was, oh, and man. everybody was so creatively engaged. And, and as an actor, to be able to be part of something and then towards the end of the story with myself and, you know, I was Ragnar's nemesis. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of input and they listened to us and we got to actually play out some of our, our own fantasies and ideas of what we wanted and then actually shoot one episode in a way that was very radical and different. And it... It was like so creative. It was so, because yeah. a lot of the time as an actor, as you know, you, 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 you're sometimes just forced into the position of you've just got to deliver. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. You've got your Same line. Yeah. Just deliver, make it work. And, and then when you actually get a, a chance to be part of the whole creation, it's very fulfilling. And so yeah. I loved doing that. And I think playing, playing a king like that, I probably, I've done it in Shakespeare a couple of times, but I, I'm not sure I met it. I think I was just at, at an age or a time in my life where I had the balls yeah. to actually grab, grab the role. You yeah. Because that's what you need as an actor sometimes. You, you just got to be able to just take it. Yeah. And I'm, that's not always my instinct. I'm often a little shy of just owning something. Oh, like you were that. so, so amazing in that role. And was it weird to jump into another, you know, five year commitment or were you cool with that? Well, I, I didn't know. It was only a two-year commitment at the time. And then they started, the show was doing so well, they started doing like double seasons of it because originally it was 10 episodes and then we went to 20. And then I'd actually, when, when Travis left, 
we'd already decided that my demise was going to be on because I so the characters were so intri intricately linked. Yeah. That in a way, when he'd gone, I needed to go. And I remember after Travis had gone, Michael came to me on one of these boozy nights we you have, you know, drinking wine. Yeah, of course. Ireland. As you, as one does in Ireland. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when when in Ireland. <laughs> exactly. Do us the Irish. Yeah, yeah, Do yeah. us the Irish. And he said, do you want to stay? I was like, oh, God, man, that's a really tough call because yeah. I, love, I love the place, I love the work, I love the people, I love, but I've al we've already charted the character and it almost felt like it was, it was such a difficult thing, but I kind of knew instinctively it was just right to leave. It was the right moment to make it a proper arc, you know? Yeah. And I said to Michael straight away, I said, no, we should end it, we should end it. And he yeah. said, you're right, you're right. <laughs> so he, did. he didn't want and to lose you. But that's but it was not it was nice to be asked, but it was it, it just sometimes, you know, back to this thing of structure. Often, you know, as an actor, we can get a lot of credit for like being great actors. And and it, believe me, you know it is it is a craft and it is a great art, and I'm still still wrestling with it a lot of the time. But when you're given good writing and when you're given good structure half the job more than half yeah. the job is done for you yeah and your job is not to f it up and your yeah. job is not to get in the way of it don't overcomplicate it so yeah. i'm i'm a great lover of structure and stuff and that was with that particular character it you know the end was already in sight and it would have just dribbled on and i think i would have felt hmm I'm just turning up for the money kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I need it. Yeah. <laughs> we all do, man. So then what, what was that? Was it Mandy or Homeland that was next? Um, it was Homeland. Yeah, it was Homeland. Uh, and I had heard that you enjoyed the show. Was that, is that true? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. So was it cool it. to come on and meet David Wellington? I mean, talk about diversity, man. It's so cool that, you know, like you going back to what you said about your mother and, and playing mm. so many, you know, diverse and eclectic. I mean, that's why you're so fucking brilliant, you know, like to go from Vikings to, you know, this kind of advisor to this, mm. you know, mm. president mm. who is hated, mm. you know, and especially mm. the, the kind of meta nature of the show with what's going on in our own democracy. Was it, was a real, yeah. you know, and Elizabeth did the show and I got so much love for her. You know, oh, Marvel. Yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. Marvel. Uh, we've worked together so many times. Yeah, don't I you mean, have a movie coming out again with her? We we did a movie together. I roped her into that one. That's my fault. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's a dear, sweet friend. I And I'm such a talented actress. And to me, I mean, I've worked with her quite a bit on Law and Order. And we'd actually, she was, she played my wife in Kidnapped even before that. So I've been a big admirer of Beth. But when she, to get to join the show and be with her as a sparring partner. Yeah. She's one of the best scene partners you could ever hope for. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes the other thing about, uh, you know, acting and actors, you're as often only as good as the person you're opposite, You're in the right? seat, yeah, totally, totally. Isn't it? And, and so going in there, having a role that could work with Beth and, and, and combat her and test her and, we could take it to some places and occasionally we'd really be able to push the boundaries with it, you know, and sometimes too far, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that show has its own kind of rhythm and pace and you're very much uh, wrestled into that. Yeah. But it's, but that's a lot of that is done in the editing, to be honest. And that's and why it, I never, I never watched it to begin with. I couldn't watch once I joined the show, it ruined it for me because I was a, such a fan. I used to watch it. I couldn't watch it once I joined it because you realize the way they edit, the way they yeah. change your perspective, that's, as an actor, you don't have any control. Any control, yeah, I and know. And nor should you, because they're flipping you all the time. Like, you're, seeing, you're always seeing something from a different perspective. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I was glad that, you know, I was scared to sign on because it was one of those ones where I joined with that little scene at the end of, of season six, yeah. is it? and then not knowing what the hell they were going to do with me in the next one. I didn't yeah. have no idea. And I called up Alex Ganser and I was starting to get cold feet. So I thought, listen, I'm getting on in my life. I can't just sign up for things, not know. And he said, yeah, what's well, going to happen? He said, I, he said, I can't, we don't know yet. He said, and I cannot promise you anything. 
I can only tell you, I really want to do some great stuff with you. And it turned out they did. So I was yeah. very blessed. It was one of my favorite seasons. And also Richmond, Virginia is my home. That's where oh. I grew up. What did you think oh, of Richmond? Man. Oh, what a place. I mean, what a history. Yeah. A, there's a lot to learn there, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Statues I, are I fine laid down. They are. Are they? Yeah. Are they well, there's one, one left now with the Robert E. Lee and there's a lawsuit going on to get oh rid of it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. But they've turned wow. it into this radical kind of Berlin wall of just like everything that's been going on. It's it's a memorial right. now to all the lives, wow. the, the, the black lives that we've lost, you know, throughout oh, all wow. this. So, wow. Yeah, you know, it's a city trying to reconcile its past while finding its future. Like like this country is right now. Yeah. And, and talk to me, you know, after 2016 election and being in this kind of disinformation arc that's exploited, sorry for anyone listening, by a Russian asset. Was that, was that really, you know, kind of life imitates art, art imitates life? Was that, was that fascinating? Well, back to the Homeland gig, you know, when obviously they predicted a Hillary win, which is why Beth Marvel was playing the president. Yeah. And then... They, she'd already shot that season and the election happened. No one saw that coming. Yeah. And they had to, and it is all credit to the writers, how they managed to sort of turn it in on itself and do like a sort of mirror Polaroid to the re, the world we are actually in. And that's what I, I agree with you. I thought that season was particularly interesting. Oh. Also because every writer in the writer's room was outraged and, and trying to sort of vent, if you like, yeah. and get kind of understand it and put it up there. And, and there was one scene I remember I had with a, with a Russian ambassador and uh, I was going for this scene. I was, I was, I mean, I, and the director came in and said, man, I think you're going to have to just, you know. It was said, man, <laughs> I'm doing this for the American people. Yeah, <laughs> we need it. You know, so um, yeah, it's been, I mean, look, man, this this past four years has been, intense and this last year has been uh, unprecedented extraordinary i think we've all been challenged in ways yeah none of us even probably thought we ever would be and uh i'm still trying to make sense of it all and 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 as much as i feel like sometimes I, it's kind of easy to despair in the midst of it i'm also a great um well, it's not a believer but I, I get i get a sense that you know progress doesn't happen easily yeah, it, it, it's like any process. Even often as an actor, you go through that trying to find a role. It doesn't happen just like that. Sometimes you, and it's a messy business. And I and I hope that whatever we're going through now is is also part of the collapse. Is also the opportunity for the rebirth. Yeah, so it's a, that's something a, new. Yeah, to emerge out of this. And uh, I suppose I'm a diehard optimist underneath but i, I appreciate say- it i needed to hear it man you know <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 kind of back into your existential meltdown days of just like <laughs> what does it all mean you know is there, is there any hope <laughs> but yeah uh, you know talk to me man because like you're truly one of the best actors in the world and you know i obviously i'll ask about it for the fans real quick Let, let's talk about mandy what what was it like to do something so bizarre well, yeah, great question. And um, I mean, it was, the short answer is, it was absolutely wonderful. But how it came about is kind of strange in itself. I remember I was supposed to be doing a little indie film. Uh, it was before um, going back to Homeland. I was supposed to do this little indie film. It, the money fell out and gone. I went, all oh, right, okay, yeah. shame. But I got the summer now, finish off the summer in the city. It'd be nice. And then there was this call saying there's this crazy movie with Nick Cage, Andrew Riseborough, Johan Johansson's doing the music. And I was yeah. like, wow, this guy called Panos Cosmatos is directing. I was like, what the hell? So I thought, well, I'll give it a read. I sat down, read this thing. I had no idea what I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm glad he said it because me either. <laughs> I was like, yeah. what is this? I, I, I literally had no reference point. Yeah. I was like, there's demons on motorbikes and, and crazy chainsaw things and, and, and animation and what is it? So I, I left the room and I just said to my wife, I said, well, I don't, I'm not going to be doing that. I said, I don't, yeah. I don't even know what it is. 
She said, well, at least talk to the director. And I said, yeah, but if I talk to him, I'm going to get He's going to force me into it. Well, yeah. But so anyway, I it wasn't even an offer at that point. What I did was I had a couple of beers and I, I uh, sat down, I, I read it again. And then I watched his earlier movie and I suddenly had this transmission of, oh, this guy really has some sort of, I call it spell. Yeah. Like magic in, in what he does. And although it's not my genre, uh, I started to understand what the role was, what its function was as a depiction of the male ego in yeah. all its rawest, most violent terms. And it was actually a journey of that, that demise. And I saw it as this sort of archetype. And as soon as I got on the call with Panos, I'd, I'd said to myself, if I get on the call and there's a 23 year old kid there going, yeah, man, we're going to blow shit up. And you know what? I'm going to be off the call and out of this. Thing. Yeah. What was there was this beautiful giant of a man with this warm sense of humor and this super intelligence and this great, uh, sense of of ownership of what he was doing he had a vision and I, he had a vision man yeah that's it you said it that's it he had a yeah. vision and i i got if you like we met on that call and we started just riffing on it and then i went to work on it and it was in some ways one of the toughest things i've ever had to do in terms of finding the role yeah but when i was working with him i trusted him and the way he shot was so simple and working with Nick Cage was fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I, was that your first time working with him? Yeah, I'd never met Nick before, but I was a big admirer because yeah. I just think that guy's got balls of steel, you know? He's oh, just, me too, <laughs> man. I'm one of the, I'm a huge Nick Cage lover. I love his choices. Yeah. No matter how loud they may be, I, I, I respect him, you know? No, because they're really, you know, they're thoughtful choices. You yeah. know, they're not just like crazy choices. He's not just being crazy for the sake of it. He, yeah. He actually thinks about this shit and he's a real cinephile. I mean, yeah. I was embarrassed when we were at Sundance and we were asked these questions about what Japanese anime anime film did you enjoy? I was like, I was, I'm, <laughs> that would be me I, too, brother. I'm, I'm watching yeah. Homeland, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> but they, and they, he has this whole reference for it. But we had this interesting thing where right from the get go, it was Nick's idea actually, and I, I appreciated it. Um, he, we met and we talked about, because obviously the two roles are complete nemesis to each other. Um, and we said, he said, listen, I don't think we should hang out. And I said, well, I think that's cool. Yeah. So we didn't even talk. On so this you set. didn't really kind of meet him till after at like a well, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was literally on the set. He'd be sitting like three feet away, and we would not converse at all, wow. at all. And it, but you know what? Some people think, ah, oh, that's weird. That's kind of methody. It was fantastic because yeah. I think as an actor, one, you know, all actors know this. One of the hardest things you have to deal with is all the social stuff on the yeah. set. The people that you know, the, being nice to people, getting, you know. And, and, and getting the work done while not being an asshole. You know what I mean? Exactly. You understand yeah. why a lot of people are assholes because yeah. they're just trying to get the work done, you know? Yeah. And so I appreciated just, you know, he was in his zone. I was in my zone. It just meant when you came to the camera, you know, that that's what it was about. And yeah. it was very liberating. It was cathartic. And I didn't know how the movie was going to turn out, but when I saw it, I was just so proud. Oh man, I'm so, so happy. proud! And uh, I, I've had so much fun uh, with Panos since he's become, you know, I mean, in one way we're like worlds apart, but in another way we're like brothers. You know, yeah. just, I just see eye to eye with him, and I love his spirit and I love his creativity. Yeah. So it was a joy. It was an absolute joy to do. And th oh. those jobs, they rarely come along. You know, they're, yeah. They're, they're, Maybe a few in a lifetime you get where you just kind of have that creative release and, yeah. and be part of something that is original as well. Yeah, and which is getting rarer and rarer in these days of IP and, and comic book movies. You know what I mean? That's right. It, it, That's right. Well, you know, brother, I could talk to you all day. Final few questions here. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm curious now in your career, having had the diversity and the amazing things you have, what makes you say yes? What are you interested in now as an artist and as an actor and as a human? Gosh, that's a great question. I mean, what makes, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I still like to be tested and, and I, I do still love the craft of acting. I, I, 
often thought maybe Marlon Brando was right and that the most mature thing you could do as a person is give up acting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I did give it up for a while and I learned a lot about myself and how I thought I needed this job and this image to support me. Now, I think I've gone a bit beyond it, but during this COVID time, I've not had this job, if you like, to support yeah. me. And I, I've missed it. And that's in, in a healthy way. So I, I want to keep working and working my craft. And if there's anything that attracts me, I've been fortunate in my career a few times to play those kind of roles where you're playing, you know, you're playing a genius, like yeah. playing Van Gogh, or I've played Samuel Taylor Coleridge, or playing wow. Robert Kennedy. When you're given those characters where you have to really bring out the best in yourself, and you have to stretch and reach. So I, I love, I'd love to play somebody like an Elon Musk type character. Oh, you would be great. You know, someone yeah. who's like just lives in a different cerebral plane. and yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'd love to do something like that. But when it when it really comes to the creativity, a lot of actors probably will say this. I'm sure that you, you there's only so much you can do as an actor. So I've started to write. My wife and I have written. Oh, movie. that's so. I, you're kind of going into my next question: is what's been keeping you inspired? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I think this is why I bang on about uh, structure and craft. And, yeah. and if you write something well, you, you know, you, you can get anybody to act it because, yeah. in a way already on the page you know and credit to homeland that the writing on that was so smart yeah that in most of the time you just had to deliver it so i i love i i find it incredibly humbling and challenging the the the, the writing thing because you're a writer right as well did you i'm say? an actor but i i do write you know so yeah yeah, yeah. we got to work on something together it would be well i'd love yeah. that I, yeah i mean i I, I don't know how good a collaborator I am yet in that oh, kind of thing. I, I would My do wife it. and I nearly killed each other. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we wrestled with, you know, we had as a, a, a subject matter and a, a character a topic we really wanted to, to share. And I think that's the important thing is you got to tell stories that really matter. Yeah. And I think that comes down to also when you're acting sometimes, I mean, I, I worked, I did a thing in the UK a couple of years ago with a, the wonderful Timothy Spall. Do you know who uh, that is? Yeah. Yeah. Just such a great actor. But he said, you know, sometimes you do a job for the art. Sometimes you do it for the money and sometimes you do it just for a friend, you yeah. know? So it's, those are the three choices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course I always want the art one, you know, I, yeah. I and that's yeah. the one where you feel like, you know, well, it's wow, cause you're really an artist. Cooked. I, I, it's sometimes hard to 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 hold that identity and believe you you are an artist, but oh, I you, think that's what actors have to. You I think we all have to. Such an inspiration for me. You're one of the like watching your career, man. It's it's a masterclass because like I'll be honest that you know the best artists steal, and I'm just trying to do what Linus does. You know. Well, that's very sweet of you. But I, I, I happen to, when they asked me to do this podcast with you, I, I watched your Bill Pullman one. And I, I, you know, I am such a fan of his because he's that guy for me as well. You know, yeah. he's one of those actors that just, he just keeps delivering really yeah. interesting, nuanced, different. Yeah. You know, he's kind of the same guy, but you never know what's going to, what he's going to do. Well, the sinner's about to pick up. I'll have to hit him up and you and I and him, we shall do the sinner together. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. I so love that. final question for you, brother. Well, yeah. you know, talk to me. I ask every actor this and I'm sorry, I know it's a loaded question, but you know, answer it however you can. For all the aspiring artists, actors, you know, that are out there, maybe disillusioned as we both got at one point, but still wanting to pursue this career. Any, any words of advice you would have for them? Well, I, don't, I mean, I think we might have already just said it. I mean, I'm, 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 I struggle with it now. And I think the writing is, is something that allows me to have a creative voice. But I think, I think staying connected to the why of storytelling you know yeah. it, it's st telling stories is not just for entertainment yeah They're, they are a part of our humanity yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a i think there's a native american indian tribe that basically describe human beings as non-feathered storytelling creatures yeah because what we've just done now we've shared a story i mean yeah. mostly 
Uh, mostly been about me. We have not talked enough about you, but, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the difference. I suppose that's the role of the, you're the interviewer. But yeah. We work by story. And I think if you can, and I'm, I'm saying this out loud to sort of boost myself, but believe in yourself as a storyteller. Yeah. You know, whether that is means you write it or you're going to act it or you're going to share it. And, you know, you look at someone like Lin-Manuel Miranda and what he did with Hamilton. He walked around New York for five years with this thing in his head and he just yeah. beat it out. He beat it out. And there's a joy and there's something in us that needs to tell story and interpret story. So I think if you can stay connected to that source, there's always a place for that. Yeah. And look at the world we're in now in terms of these platforms for story. It's yeah. It's unprecedented. I mean, I grew up when there was two channels on TV. Yeah, now, now it's like Facebook and it's doing content and United Airlines is about to do, you can't even keep up with it anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's always room for it. And the other, the thing I'm having, I tell you, this is just a, a, a confession, but it's also a small revelation I made, you know, that self-taping yeah. is, I have never got a job on a self-tape. Not a one, not a one. I've been lucky to get through, but I'm now in a place now where I'm going to have to get a job. <laughs> yeah, I just had one yesterday. So, you know, how'd I'm, it go? How'd it go? Well, I don't want to jinx it or sound like a no. cocky asshole, but I, it was a small co star guest star a week ago. And then yesterday, they hit me up for a series regular. It's a new Michael Keaton show. So and you got it. You got the no, role. no, no, no. I, oh. I, I, I had the audition for the bigger role oh. yesterday. So right. we're right. gonna fingers crossed. You know. Right. Yeah. Right. But because I, I think you know, if if you're in, if you're an actor and you you're in this world of having to self tape, and I've had a very bad attitude towards it. Yeah. I've had because I don't. It's not how I like to work. I don't want to have to make snap decisions. Yeah. I like to layer stuff over time. Sometimes I don't even know what I really want to do until I get there. Yeah. Even though I'm building, I don't know. And so I'm doing a self-tape from a position of, hey man, you know, I'm just doing the best I can in this shitty situation. Cut <laughs> me a fucking you... break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and I suddenly realized the other day that that stinks. And then, like I said earlier about being committed to something, being yeah. 100%, I'm gonna start doing my self-tapes in a completely new way. Yeah. Uh, so watch out. <laughs> do, you, do you live in New York City when COVID is not going on? Yeah, yeah. We but we managed to get a place uh, up in the mountains in uh, Warwick, uh, oh, New York. So, so, so oh. we we've been here through the whole COVID thing, and, and I'm so glad we got this place. It's kind of like almost like a little retreat, at the bottom of a valley. Yeah. Uh, so I've hardly been in the city this past week. Where are you now? I'm in I'm in Brooklyn. I say that because okay. I would love to get coffee and talk to you in person one day about oh man yeah I, i'd love that yeah have, have you got my you got my email and stuff i'm gonna uh, uh stop recording now so you but here let me i am thrilled to announce that an actor despairs is partnering with a wonderful cbd company called kind farms everyone out there has heard of cbd I started taking it a few years ago when I first started getting sober and to help with my anxiety. Sadly, as one can do, I was overtraining in the gym and a friend recommended a topical and a tincture to help with the pain. I tried it. It was okay. However, recently, I was introduced to a product that has really changed my life. Not only has it helped me with anxiety, but I am stronger than I have ever been. I'm able to carry out lifts my body used to prevent me from doing. Kind Farm products have single-handedly changed my life athletically and personally. They utilize 100% local licensed farmers, organic cultivation, and CO2 extraction for superior CBD. Kind Farms is turning CBD to a kind alternative to pharmaceuticals. Let's transform tobacco row into hemp row. If you want to get involved, please reach out. Together, we can make a difference. You can use my code RYAN10 for 10% off. You can find them on Instagram at Kind Farms Inc. All one word. That's K I N D P H A R M S I N C. And their website is kindfarmsinc.com. Once again, my code for 10% off is Ryan10.